Aloha and welcome to the one within all. You're listening to Interverse. My name is Chance and today I am excited to introduce to you a super snazzy new social media network called Network 99 with an interview with its founder, Tim Coomer. That is how I say it, right, Tim? Yep. When he's not busy working on N99 and liberating humanity from corporate controlled platforms like Facebook and Twitter, Tim roams the magical land of Scotland, creating music, writing, and designing art for album covers for fellow musicians. On top of all that, Tim is the creator and host of a podcast called Life is People that seems to be a lot like this one in spirit. So I hope you check it out, the links in the episode notes, and also go create a profile on N99 to say hi to me and Tim. But most importantly, I want you all to welcome Tim to the show with such powerful love lasers that he can feel them blasting open his heart chakra so we can get all his good stories and secrets. Welcome to the uh, podcast, Tim. Oh, that's my brother. uh, That was uh, very illuminating. I I, I was uh, saying to someone the other day, I think one of the, uh, I'll never get to the age of my life or to the point in my life I'm never embarrassed to hear anybody talk about yourself. It's one of the most embarrassing things in the world, man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I totally understand. And even when you're a podcaster, it's even worse because you have to listen to your own voice a lot. And you're like, ah, oh, cringe, you know? Well, I, I can tell you that one. To this day, I, I have I maybe listened to two of my the, the previous Life is People. I can't do it. I can't listen to my own voice. I know how annoying I sound. <laughs> well, it's, it's that. And two, being on a path like this, you get a lot of self-reflection just coming with the package. Uh, For a lot of us, even not making a podcast, we're going through a lot of self-reflection all the time and therefore we're analyzing our thought patterns and our behavior and the things we say and how often we say like or something like that (laughs) and realizing, oh, I could uh, bring some consciousness to this behavior and modify it. So when you're on that type of a path and you go look back at yourself from even a month ago, you're like, man, I was kind of stupid. I don't even really feel that way anymore. I mean, there's so much to change in in terms of, uh, you know, the way we are presenting ourselves to the world and what we see as important. And that's that's constantly evolving and and changing that worldview that we're presenting to everybody. So, I I mean, overall, I think it's a good thing to constantly be changing that and updating it with new information. But it does make it hard to go back and watch yourself. I I completely concur with you, but I, I, I... I've been investing with this thought recently that one of the, 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 the way we are at this moment in history, obviously, we're, we're, we've got the ability to record these messages. So, you know, this, to, to, my, to someone to me who's lived through the time pre-internet, this is all absolutely futuristic. I mean, I remember being tw- in my 20s and this was an absolute dream. I'd be talking live, open mic, free, free-form conversation with somebody in another part of the world. But what's fascinating is we've been kind of contemplating this for the last few weeks, thinking, okay, we're, we're laying all these seeds, all these ideas out there, and all these thoughts, us being real, all this, is that, that future generations are going to absolutely, can you imagine the harvest of history they're going to have? I mean, we, we talked about Daniela Bonelli before we went live. Can you imagine what future historians are going to be able to look back? And instead of just reading the history told by the leaders and the people who, who won the battles, we're going to get real in-depth conversations from real people. And, and that's like no, no time, I think, ever before in human history that we've had this awakening of real conversations like this, unfiltered, that, that, that we've never had before, I think. You know, that's why I think it's a... I say often, I think these are really are the greatest days to be living in because this whole communication where we're about to do, I think it's, we're just on the edge, or, I've, or to be more precise, I think we're in the renaissance right now of human creativity, but I don't think many people realize the actual, um, as one of my, my dear friends says, it's like the flower of life is, is opening in front of us and not many people are understanding of like how beautiful this flower is that's it's blooming in front of us. Yeah, we're at a point of our highest potential ever and also at a point where we've, we're have we realizing that the reason we're not expressing even a fraction of that potential is a great deal of control that's been exercised over us and intervention in that history story that you're talking about. I think we are now in the time where finally, if you want to, you can actually go and get the alternative information and figure out for yourself what the actual story of our history is and how we got to the point we're at, including, you know, something I'm sure we're going to talk about it coming up, the surveillance state and the extreme 
control freak aspects of world governments. And in my opinion, when you start digging into the history of these things, you realize it's always been that way. And this is just the crowning pinnacle of what they call the new world order that's uh, emerging globally right now. However, at the same time, as you're saying, the flower of life is opening before us. Technology is allowing us to connect to each other and to express the ideas that allow us to transcend the problems that we've been clinging to as that were, you know, seen as solutions, but are actually bigger problems than they are solutions. Things like using oil, things like the practice, the global practice of carnism, you know, all these very, very destructive behaviors that we, we had seen as necessary for so long. We can start shaking those shackles off. And I think at the same time as our, I think there's an, a principle in the occult that as our morality increases, our freedom increases as well. So we have to look at the situation around us and, you know, we can't even just blame external forces for all the surveillance, the, the sorcery of the CIA, <laughs> because in the end, it's all a, an extension of our personal inability to take responsibility for our own needs and our own creations. 100%, my friend. I mean, I think if you, that's why I often say we're right now, we're, we're a tipping point. And that's why I say on one hand, we have the, 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 the whole concept of the flower of life and all the potential. I mean, this is, I, could, I could spend for now all evening telling you about just the, the amount of potential, there's tools that are out there that, that are available right now that are just, just literally just within millimeters of our grasp and how we, we we're at a point in the human history where like like i say people cryptocurrencies and ideas of connecting people through these are all just at the tip of our fingers but yet again on the other side which is the duality of life there's that whole doom element of the, the control and this is where this tipping point is and i i think when it all boils down to it, and i think you, you you so erudite you put your, your finger upon the on the very you know the very point it's it's what we as humans do, and it all breaks down to this because it's something that since jumping down the rabbit hole of trying to build technology, and you know, coming from an arts point of view, I'm not a coder in any sense, and like jumping into this whole world, the more and more you realise that with the growing, I don't like to call it artificial intelligence, but with the growing intelligence that's rising through machines and through what's coming, the one edge we've got, I think, above all when you break it down, is we've got this ability of Whatever, and this is where we get lost in words, what you want to call it, but that inner potential, that inner human creativity, that no machine, yes, they're going to, they're going to accelerate past us in, in things they're going to be able to do, you know, you know, they're going to, be able to run faster, jump faster, so they're going to be running, all sorts of things. And we're going to be left with one thing only, creativity. And that's one of the things, and this, like you said, in that whole sinister element of the world, they've always sucked this out of us. It's not just happened in the last 10 years, it's happened all my life. I mean, I'm sure your reflections of going through school is exactly the same as mine. I wanted to be a creative person and it was kind of like, no, 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 no. They had you boxed in and, and they had your job and that and they had you nailed down when you were five years old. So these, it's, they've always tried to suppress creativity, particularly in the Western part of the world. And that's the duality where we are right now because I've often thought, I don't know how you think about it, but I've often thought if you could just get 150 truly creative people connected with the, with the tools that are there you could shift a paradigm in a, in a in a in a moment but it's the trouble is dude and this is always the thing us creative people we're always i always say we're very individualistic hence i always say we're, it's like trying to herd cats we just <laughs> <laughs> i say that one all the time <laughs> that's great that's great uh herding cats that's what i always say whenever i'm having trouble with a group of people but uh, to your to your point i think we're going to have to, like I said, rise out of uh, our collective negative behaviors and the apotheosis idea of, you know, finding truth by eliminating that which is not truth. And uh, anything that limits a person's uh, perception of their own value to anything other, if it's limited in any way, your perception of your own value, then that is an incorrect perception. And, you know, your value is literally infinite. Even if you created an intelligence in a machine that had a type of infinite intelligence capacity, that would still not be the same size of infinity as the infinite infinite that exists as the creative potential within each and every human being. 
if you recognize that in yourself and in other people, then you actually truly love yourself because love is the recognition of potential in whatever the object is of your love. And well, the ultimate recognition is that the object and subject are actually not separate. And so the more that you recognize your own potential and therefore love yourself, the, the less you're going to accept any form of slavery in the first place. And the less is going to exist in your world in the first place because you're going to be less dependent on the mechanisms that entrap us into the slavery systems. Like you, if you truly love yourself to the point that you know your own potential, what would stop you from just make growing all your own food? You know, it's our idea that we're too busy with our jobs and with our, or that we don't know how and we can't learn that keeps us from doing these things. All of these are fear-based mindsets because they're mindsets that involve the limiting of your own personal power and potential. So, and in as many ways as we can eliminate these and share with others the truth that all types of perceptions that limit your own personal power are illusory, the faster that we can hopefully stop this uh, bullet that's head, uh, heading towards the head of planet Earth in form of the eco side that is being visited upon on every corner of it. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I've been wrestling this with my friend all my life, and, and I've got, I, you can go through many, many mind melts about how, you know, what we're about. And I think there's two elements, and I think we both agree on it, is one... You know, real wisdom comes and you realize like, there's no point in trying to change anyone else. You've got to change yourself first. And that's, that's the first lesson that you, any kind of path down, any, any form of enlightenment makes you realize. But I think with the, the, the other one you, you, you're tying into is, is you know, you, you're talking about, you know, the, the, maybe the lag between what, what's around. And I, I've often thought this is like, why have we got to this point? Why? And I'm old enough. And again, I'm, I'm, you know, I remember, like I said, I've heart this before. I remember in 1994 and thinking, okay, this is going to be it. I remember sort of sitting almost around, you know, when I was my student days like this, sitting around thinking, wow, look at this internet. We're going to personal to personal. We're going to be able to connect. I'm going to be able to talk to somebody and look at this. We started, our minds started to melt of like the potential that was going to rise. And what happened is, and I've, I've, I thought, the potential, the tools have always been there. What happened was we all became lazy. We all just switched off and we all just went, oh, well, we let somebody else deal with it. We let somebody else do it. We let, so, and we just, it's, and it's like you said, it's this choice. So we, you start to realize, like, okay, if that's the drag of you, of, of the people, society around us, is they, they just don't want to almost like engage with anything. And you think, okay, I can understand that. You know, I, for instance, you know, we're both be on the same page. And you must think, why doesn't everybody just stop? You know, you know, they they speak to you and they sit, they sit and say to you, oh, I hate my my life. You know, I've got I've got the nine to five job. I put the suit on, and they sit there for hours and they and they have these really enlightened conversations about how they see the world as one and, and all this, you know, absolute complete enlightened you know visions of the world and then they want to put their suit back and you say well, why'd you do it and they say like you said fear and what's the biggest drive of fear is i think if you people are always saying okay okay great you can paint me a utopia and you can paint me this and i think we're as human beings we're wise enough to know like yeah we don't want to have painted magical kingdoms we want true realities and that's been the frustrating thing for me for the last maybe three or four years thinking, man, if people understood like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and that, that this is there, this is the way out. And I think the more and more people that basically make that move and migrate, they're going to inspire a whole generation of people because they're going to say like, wow, I can just walk free. And we're seeing the steps now. Now, we you know, since your path of doing you know, the inner verse. And since I started doing life as people, I've seen the yeah, apocalypse in YouTube, but I've also seen patron rise and other platforms rise and just easy, making it easier and easier and easier every step for people to go, there you go. You can go, you know, project yourself to the world and, and like you say, and it, it illuminate the knowledge you have. And like never, not, never before we got this. And I think that it, this is where it becomes almost like a, a, a you know, the push and pull and it, the way you, you, I think you really shift consciousness in a quick way is if you have people that are the leader, the, the people that people go, wow, look at it, look at universe. He, he did this all by himself. He didn't have a Fox TV or CNN support in him. He did this by himself, step by step. And this right now we're all struggling man, because we're, we're making our way like with the tools and stuff, but five years down the line, 10 years down the line, man, this is how you really shift it. It goes back to a 
when I, I spent some years living in uh, Venezuela and I lived some time amongst some tribes people there and I, I had these conversations with, with you know, these gentlemen there just solely because I kind of got almost to the point of how are we ever going to change the society around and I kind of, that's why I went to South America thinking, okay, I'm going to understand this and try to, you know, find some real life and see if it's, you know, like you said, more in touch with nature. And the one thing that after all these discussions I had with the tribes guys was they said to me, look, the thing about your world is you've got it all. You've got all the freedom. You've got all the technology. You've got better medical health care. Don't, don't, don't see us as noble savages. We're not, we're far from it. We want, we want electricity. We want all the things you've got. We don't, we don't want to be sitting in, you know, malaria swamps. You know what I mean? But the one thing that they understood more than anything else hence the reason you don't see suicide rates you don't see mental illness in the rates of, of, amongst those people and they said was because basically we had lost our ability to as you said nature and to self-reliance and i think that's all come around from this rise which i tie it all back to of technology because everything is free so i thought this every twitter's free facebook's free so it gives everybody a microphone to go out there and shout but it's like we're not uh, we, we can't discern between the people who've got wisdom and the people who are just shouting i hate trump i hate hillary i hate trump and you, you get lost in this melee of noise and it's i think we're just at the moment i think honestly where we are like i said it's that tipping point where we as humans of understanding like we've got the tools but what do we do with them and that's why we need people like, I think there's people like yourself and me to stand up and say, look, this is what the potential doing this tool. You can stand up and shout and scream and, and, and put negativity into the world, or you can use it as a small tool, as the tribes guy said to me, just one person to one person to one person, and you switch them on. And it's just that little chain effect that in the soon, you know, it's like a mathematical opening of the flower. Before you know it, everything's changed. And you get that by people standing up. And these are the, I think the bridge we're at right now, but the, you're seeing platforms and bridges being built to say, to say to people, hey, you don't have to do that nine to five. You don't have to do that soul destroying stuff anymore. You don't have to go and do that that, that thing you know is just grinding you down as a human being and then you look at yourself at 50 and go, what, what happened? What happened? That, those, those pathways, those bridges are being built and that's why I say it's, it's, it is really a, a, a yin yang, good evil fight right now between the people who are wanting that illumination and the higher want, the higher being of, of human beings, and those who want to put us down to the other side. And I, I, I mention all this because at the end of the day, I think it's like you you illuminated that with all this in our hands, we can't be like it was when I was when I was twenty one and go, oh, we will just sit back because if we do, dude. We're not going to see that world, and we're we're literally going to be put into into camps and marched into battlefields that that we won't have any any say on, man, because they will just put us on battlefields. We've seen this through human history, and that's why it's, I say it over and over again. And with like with what we do, what we do. It's just to tell people, look, you've. If you want freedom, you've got to do something for it. You, if you want to be the higher being, you can't just sit there and let life pass by you, man. You've got to engage, even on a small level. Yeah, the thing to engage with is the cleaning up of the messes around us. Mm -hmm. the, in, the entire aspect of, I think what a lot of people feel right now is they have these high points in life like you're talking about, like when you were younger with your friends and idealistic and looking towards the future where you are, you know, you're at a peak. You're in a, a, a form of what I would call a, like Dionysian um, intoxication, like you're intoxicated on life, on the universe, uh, maybe on actual intoxicants for all we know. <laughs> and the come down from that, you know, you, while you're there, you do touch the source consciousness to an extent. You do see the infinite potential and it, and it comes back with you. The realization that, you know, all of this is an extension of something that you're creating in a mental way. And that being said, you come out of the intoxicated state, whatever, the, the liberated feeling, and all you do is look, all you see around you is basically decay, everything mm -hmm. falling apart. And, you know, at that point, most people do one of two things. They forget about the rapturous, enlightened experience that they had, or they go back for more in terms of, something that's a self-destructive behavior that helps them reach that chasing the dragon and, you know, burn out in that sense. So what we really need is to come to that point through a different 
route, that point of the sort of ecstatic, enlightened view of the world where we can see all the infinite potential and know that we can change things. And I think the creative act itself is what gives people that type of elatement. I think engaging with the truth in any capacity, whether it's just deeply researching something occulted that affects your own self because it's part of where you came from. Like I highly recommend people look into human origins to look into the occult history of the world. A really good place to start would be Michael Tessarion. Uh, he has a series called Oracles and Origins you can find on YouTube. I'll link it and it's hours and hours of material, but that's, you know, that's one way to get towards that, um, that recognition of unity is to dive deeply into the truth. And then another way to do it is to speak to others about, you know, what is right and what you see in the world that you want to affect change in. And then the most powerful way to use your voice is to actually make personal changes in your life. And it is a step wise snowball progress that you make. You, you can't just ditch everything at once most of the time in terms of things that are harmful behaviors or behaviors that are that you have deemed necessary. Like I have to have a job, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you can, you know, you can take those little, you can take small steps one at a time. You can start trying to create less trash. You can, you know, find way, take, take your own packaging to the grocery store instead of, and, and get things in bulk. Who knows? There's a million little examples, but I think that anyone that's, anybody that's trying to expand their creative capacities tends to intrinsically know that they need to also improve their self as a person at the same time if they want to get there. And it's something that I don't hear talked about in, in relation to creativity a whole lot, but it's, it is whenever I bring it up to people, they do tend to agree that that's their experience as well. So I'm, I'm curious, is that kind of your experience? Do you uh, find that you expand creatively the more healthier you get mentally or physically? Or spiritually? Oh, I, I completely. And I, I, I'll be real on this because <laughs> I can. I mean, I'm sure, like many uh, creative people, I, I can. You can drop me in the middle of, you know, like one is there is, is twenty million people plus million. You know, I can, and I be, can, can be completely creative in that whole giant ant nest of humanity. But yeah, my desire is always to be uh, into nature, and I think I, I'm the same as you. I, I find many creative people that. Uh, almost they, they shut down even though they may be healthy you know they have their which is again like I say they, they, they I think the first step is to take care of your health because it's this meat machine we're walking around in and how many people just neglect that particularly in the, we, we, I talk to bands and creative people and it must it's the thing that frustrates me the most it's like you don't care you're not taking care of this machine that's you're operating on and you're just feeding your it's like I said to them it's like putting sugar in your car engine dude you, you, you know you, you've, you've literally cr you've crashed your machine so like you say there's that element of it but i find as well that like you say i i, I mean I, I often say this to people it's no accident i live out in the highlands of scotland man i i i i, I think I, do you know what i mean i i as much as i like humanity and i can i can understand that, i think they say true creativity comes from separation from humanity that isolation of of almost like i say i mean i, I it's one of those like maybe it's one of my quirks as a as, a, as an artist. I, I i find people who wear watches i don't trust them <laughs> like, Dude, why are you wearing a watch man i mean when you because I, I like to live in that whole like you say in that nature of you know, time and your, your body comes in sync and that's how you were saying about that that creative thing because i think one of the things that it's been kind of lost in this world that we I've been brought up in is, is that creativity is easy and this potential is easy. It's not, it's hard, man. And if all the distractions, like you said, it's, it's the distractions, it's the small things, that the chips, the weight, that it's the weights that you put on your back that kill you as a creative person. It's that's why the, I think cities are, are the worst thing for creative people because you have to engage with all the okay the little compliances that they're putting out the traffic lights the you know you're saying yes to a guy in a in a, in a, in a yellow high vis because he's told you to you, it's just playing with your operating system that if you didn't weren't surrounded by that noise and that chaos you, you would be in a much better flow state for want of a better word where that creativity comes from because it's it, I, you know. 
we, we no, everybody is aware they wouldn't open a spam or anything that clicks off on their offer on their computer and just open it because they know they've got the, the common sense to know. But you say to them in their their everyday lives, they're like, oh, I know you're, and they just fill their own operating system with all this spam and all this rubbish and. Uh, dude, it's, it's, it's one of the funny things about I me. Mean, like, like I say, I, I, I've been building this in, in Net, Network, Network 99. One of the principles I've got of it is turn it off and go out and do something more important instead. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want future generations to be like this generation where they're stuck in front of this machine all the time. Go out and experience nature because, you know, it's such a – it's the it's, it's one thing that we, we – there's the biggest disconnect in my part of the world and your part of the world. And I'm lucky enough to live in the Highlands, but even here, people are still disconnected. They don't understand. I mean, how many people do you know that if you put them in, a, if you said to them, okay, I'm going to put you in a tent and we're going to put you out in the middle of the, the wilderness, they would freak. I mean, literally, their, their heads would melt. And you think, well, yeah, we've, how do you think humans have got to this point? And now we, we're so weak-minded, we can't even live one night out in the jungle out in a, in, a, in a wood or out there. You know, we can't take care of our own self to that basic level. And it's so, it's so sad because that's what I'm saying about this whole world we live in. I mean, again, I've seen it in the, it's one of the, this tipping points thing. One of the things about the society we built around is it's, this fear mentality has made all our kids sit in front of machines instead of like when I was a kid, I was running around scraping my knees, not coming home till the sun went in. And that's all been lost. And you realize when you get older, you're like, that can all go so quickly. And you look at the whole generation after me and you think, oh, man, my generation have made the generation afterwards the worst, weak, weak, weak willed, weak minded, you know, cotton wool wrapped generation. And we did it. It wasn't the sinister powers and the Illuminati. We did it. And that's scary, man, because it's like the, it's like the, whole, the whole idea that, you know, it's not inside the bat, it's inside of us. We could all have been the outfits. Yeah, you know, the, the guy in outfits who put people behind bars. We could have all been that. And to say we don't, that's the scary thing where a generation, before they know it, are letting their kids wrap up in cotton wool. And freedom, those kids go up and don't know what freedom is. They don't know what it's like to go out in nature. And they're, and it's terrifying that in one generation, you can lose it, which fascinating ties into something you mentioned before. Because why is it that all, all the strong traditions, like the Aborigines, the African tribes, the the tribes in South America, why have their culture been kept so alive for all these thousands of years and now it's been broken? It's because they kept it alive with oral tradition. And that's something else we don't, we've forgotten about in our generation. We don't tell stories to each other, you know, and understand that it's almost like Chinese whispers, but we do tell stories. They change from person to person. It's almost like the skill of actually listening and passing on a bit of information. That's why almost at times you feel like you're, back, you're bashing it against the brick wall times with people. You know, have I got to go that basic level with you? Because you say, if you're, is your operating system on such a level you don't even understand that two plus two is four? It's like the George Orwell way. We've got a, we've got a generation of people thinking that's far, you know, Two plus two is what? Two plus two is what? You know, and it's, yeah. It's war scary. is peace. War is mm. peace. Ignorance is strength. Freedom is slavery. That's basically what everyone is programmed with right now. The exact George Orwellian um, 1984 thing, man. It's sorry to cut cut in there. I'm just like I, you're just having you're having me bursting with ideas with everything <laughs> you're saying, and <laughs> I think I'm as one of the kids that grew up in front of a game console more than being outside. Although I wasn't quite a hundred percent, you know, synthetic Android child, <laughs> I did get outside some. I I can say that there, it is it has been harmful to me my entire life because my idea of relaxing basically constitutes being hypnotized in front of a screen, mm -hmm. and that's you know that's really hard to break. Even as a person that's quote unquote conscious you still find yourself going, well, I consciously now choose that I want to be hypnotized by a screen. <laughs> and maybe to an extent, there's some of that that should be permissible in, you know, in our future experience as humans, because there's some great art that, be, that can come through that type of medium, just with as much truth as any other medium. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a movie's worth a billion. Mm. But you know, documentaries that can have been one of the most powerful ways of waking me up to different truths. I mean, practically the only way that I can get information that is normally occulted is through someone's work like a documentary or podcast, like you're mm -hmm. saying. And that comes in to the oral tradition aspect of things. I think this 
renaissance of, you know, liberating the individual to become a content creator of whatever it is they want to create gives us the opportunity to actually start, <clears throat> I don't know, getting out of the pit, getting out of the hole because we can actually have a new oral tradition. We can, you know, the mystery traditions, I've said this before on the show, I think, but the ancient esoteric mystery traditions kept all of their, you know, in the West, they kept all of their secrets of the universe and of human psychology and of the occult and magic all to an oral tradition completely. And they actually believe that the truth couldn't even be written down mm -hmm. because as soon as you put it down into symbolic language, it becomes someone's interpretation of it and not the actual truth anymore. Just like you can't even describe what the force is that people call God with any kind of name or any kind of attributes or characteristics or anything, because if there is a creative intelligence that's infinite and encompasses all of reality, then any description is a form of separating it from the infinite and trying to say it's just that. So even infinite is barely a good enough word symbolically as a concept. So that being said, I think we can actually get a lot of higher truths across in this type of format than in writing or in, uh, I, yeah, I guess in writing in, in more just personally interpreted, interpreted symbolic language, because although people can choose how they take our words still with this type of format, we do have the ability to kind of clarify and, and have context that, you know, the written word doesn't have. And also the fact that this is so, you know, completely unscripted, it allows to me what I think is the higher creative force that I was just describing to come through and mm -hmm. sort of author the conversation between the two of us as we reach an, another form of that Dionysian uh, infinite consciousness awareness or unity consciousness, but through the, what I would call the, I guess you could, I mean, if you want to have like a mythical symbol for it, I guess you could say it would be the, the Christ unity consciousness instead of the Dionysian unity consciousness, because it, the come down from this type of, uh, of, of a high, as far as this type of a conversation, you know, when you have it out in the world, which does happen, it, and I think it's one of the most beautiful things that can happen, a spontaneous conversation like what we're having, um, you're, you're feeling inspired of what you can do, what you can change, mm -hmm. as opposed to the sort of intoxicated Dionysian come down of, you know, apathy. So I think that's why it's so important that people listening don't just take the information in. They, they should take in all kinds of information. They should process it. And they should also speak what they logically see as the re like the reasonable truth and the, the moral truth because your conscience isn't wrong you are installed with a really good conscience that unless you're like a first degree psychopath or something but i've, I've never met one of those that i know of <laughs> well they, they are they are around us <laughs> <laughs> i guess they're but, sneaky there's a couple of points i mean but, but um, and i think the first point i, I, I think relates to what you're just saying then one of the, the, the huge inspirations that, you know, right now I'm actually putting and we're putting down the documentation and we're, we're, you know, it's basically a huge inspiration behind N99 and the principles behind it was something called Brecon Law, which is, it was an ancient Irish law that went for centuries and centuries and they argue that they don't actually know how far it went back. And then that's fascinating in itself because you realize about how cultures mixed before 10,000 years ago and the Egyptian culture that came, it, but that's a whole... Another rabbit hole to go down. But the, the point I wanted to make about the Brecon Law was it's one of the things that's absolutely fascinated me, and I, I think the duality of it. One was that none of their laws were written down. None of them. No, not one of them was written down. It was all up here. And then there was, there's these, the pathways that people had to learn the oral traditions word by word and had to learn. But the, the point being was exactly what you just said. It was the idea of some of this stuff is just over the hills. It's just natural law. It's just, it's beyond, you know, beyond paper. It's just stuff. And then, and I think it's fascinating because the other duality of it was the idea that these, these Brecon law, these, the guys who would be the Druids or the older, the older respected ones, that they had the ability to have all this knowledge inside their heads. And you get kids now like, and I'm, I'm, I'm being flippant, but you know, you get kids going through school and they're like, oh, I can't, I can't study for more than two hours. And you think, man, our minds just a few thousand years ago could remember 
whole canons of, of literature in our minds and now we struggle to remember how to how to write well, it gets down to the point we are now dude we know we can't even people forget how to you, when was the last time you wrote with your hands people i was, <laughs> I, 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 was yeah, no, I am always like I, I, I keep my hands still alive but the amount of people I say to them, okay, write me an A4 piece of page and just say, you know, what you did in the last hour. And by the time it's got to the halfway down the page, it's like scribbles. They start off really nice and then they're like, it's like, we're losing this skill. We're losing all these, all these skills. And I think it's because, like you said, because and that's what they, these wisdom they had, they understood like this could all break down because ultimately us as humans, we come, something becomes lazy and we go, oh, okay, I'll go the lazy route rather than actually learning how to sit. And you think back in the day, people had to get feathers and ink and sit there and then, it was a skill. And then we, and now we just lost it. And I think it's fascinating because I think it's, and the more you realize about more cultures that they've always kept this idea alive that there's some stuff that's beyond any man-made law and it can all be remembered in our minds. And that's what we all, and you think, well, look, these people just a few thousand years ago could probably you know, argue had far more use of their, this mind here. I've often thought it's on a practical level. How many times, they saw every night, they were looking up at the stars and the skies and thinking, they were seeing things that unless, you know, unless, unless you're fortunate enough to go out and live among, you know, outside the city, you, the most people don't even realize that this is, you know, we're literally on rock tumbling and it's like, wow, well, what's all this above me? And people don't even understand that. Literally, psychedelic experience is going on above their heads all the time. So what do we do? We put street lights in. That's how they control us, dude. They, you know, literally on every single level. And I think the second point that I wanted to illuminate to, and it was going back to the, you know, you mentioned about you growing up in front of that, the generation that grew up in front of the computers. And, and I think this is one of the things, and I always, I think as a, as a, I, I as a creative, I always, I, I don't just like to sit there and focus on the good. I think that sometimes you have to look at the, you know, the, 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 the what could be class as I see it's trauma. And I think this is one of the scary things is that again, it's my generation, dude. We, we all watched our kids grow up. We put them in front of computer screens and all that. And like you said, then you become hypnotizing. But what you really wanted when you were a kid was love. That's all you wanted. And then you became doctrinated to love was that machine. And then you hated that machine because it couldn't give you love. So then you became addicted to it. And then you think about the trauma that's caused that every child's gone through. And then you think, oh, how many millions of kids is that just, and they don't even realize they're traumatized because they just see it as, oh, well, and, they just, and then it just goes on and they, get, they okay, they, they, they move on and it's the next thing. It's almost like a, a mental addiction and it's all trauma that maybe doesn't until their 30s and they, like you say, in the, in they go to toxins and they go to all these paths and, and they don't understand what it is. And they're in a bar one night and getting absolutely out of their heads and they, they don't understand what it is. And it's this deep line trauma. Like all I wanted was, me. and you're quite rightly, you're angry at your parents. And I think one of the things that I get right now is that, we, that my generation particularly have built this whole culture around us to, to sort of like alleviate blame from, from us as, as parents. We've gone, oh, well, I didn't gamble all your money away. It was a mental illness. I'm the victim. No, no, you knew what you were doing. And we've done it. You know, and this is what I'm saying, because we don't want our kids to look at us and go, oh, we didn't love you. We just gave you a way to the state. We let you educate you. We gave you to the computer machines. We gave you to corporations. We gave you to nannies. We gave you to everything else rather than the one thing we should have given you love. And that's something that if you want to talk about the dark side of life, dude, I think that's a whole pop bubble that's going to pop one day because I think that your generation particularly, it's going to hit them some, at some point and then they're going to realize the truth and it's what you do. Do you have compassion for your parents or do you, or do you have the anger for them? And that's a hard decision to make because – we're all just at the bottom line. We're traumatized, man. It's like Ronnie James Dio said, man, we're all rock and roll children thrown out in the storm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's compassion that we need to look at our, our parents with, at least speaking as someone in my generation, mm -hmm. because I see worse happening to, when I look at my own mom and dad's backstory, <laughs> I, I see, and then I look at their grandparents or their parents <laughs> and their grandparents. And I happen to, it all happens to come, like I hear a lot about this with my family, so I know that it's definitely a deep-seated thing, but like every single generation was definitely traumatized and had parental abandonment issues. So mm -hmm. actually, I think despite the screen, despite, <laughs> despite the, the state, despite the education system, despite all the things that my parents did give me up to out of ignorance, uh, they did still have some 
very strong capacity to at least express love in, oh. in some ways, you know? So for me, the, what I see that as one of the biggest symptoms of this parental abandonment trauma that most people have uh, to a small or large degree, and I don't say I don't have it. I, I just say I don't have it to a large degree. What I, I see is the biggest outcome of that is statism itself. Belief in the state on the left wing or the right wing mm -hmm. is just supplanting your perceived lack of mommy or daddy. If you didn't have enough, if you have mommy issues and you didn't have enough nurturing as a child, then you want the state to be your caretaker and your nurturer for everybody. If you have daddy issues and you didn't have enough <laughs> of a father around, then you want the state to be the protector, the strong government that stays out of your business. So there you have the right and left wings, perfect opposition to one another to allow the creation of an arch of opposition that does not ever go anywhere and just stays stable. And mm -hmm. the shadowy powers that are in the, the, you know, the top of the pyramid can keep pulling strings like they have always done. I think that is worth looking into. I think the the trauma that we're expressing generationally, this abandonment trauma, if you ask me, it's a reverberation from a concept called cosmic abandonment, mm -hmm. which is, Whatever, whatever intelligences might have been involved in intervening with the natural evolution of things on this planet to allow human beings to exist, I think there is some deep-seated psychological trauma in the human race from that event or from events leading on from that. And uh, the, you, looking into the ancient past, it is very clear that there was some sort of progen, progenitor... Uh, civilization that was worldwide that in some capacity was just cut off in its prime as well. So there could be some form of civilizational abandonment trauma from the mother civilization as well. But all in all, we're just a bunch of basically brothers and sisters that are too busy in our egos and bickering with one another to realize that we're actually family. And I think we could ditch the entire commerce system, the entire the entire government system, as soon as people realized they were actually family, because, you know, in, in commerce, what do you do if your uncle comes into your shop, you give him whatever you needed at the cost that you got it for, because he's your family. But mm -hmm. if we all realize we all have that kind of connection, why would we need to have this, this type of war going against our very families, which is the idea that I need to get money out of you for my services and I need to get as much as I can without it, without you caring that I took so much. <laughs> and that's the game everyone's playing. They pretend they're not playing it. They're like, no, I'm out to help people. I mean, I've got a Patreon. I ask for money now, to an extent that's a little different because it's a voluntary donation. I give the content out for free, you know, but even that, like I'm physically forced to play this game right now because that's what everybody around me is playing. But yeah, if, if we had this, this familial mindset, then, you know, we could take the $400 billion or whatever that they spend on war every year and easily take care of everyone's physical needs several times over. And no one can convince me that that's not true. The entire system, economically speaking, is set up to put so much of the, to extract energy into the form of money and then hoard that money so that you're literally stealing the people's energy. And that's what's happening. And it is, you know, I think it is really important that we look into the alternatives that you've brought up a few times, cryptocurrencies. But I do also want to point out that we should be wary of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and anything else that looks like the big main thing, because that's the most likely to get to have already been infiltrated, compromised and sabotaged. And when you look at Bitcoin's recent history, there's plenty of evidence for that. Lots. There's a lot of times where lots of Bitcoin has just gone missing or been stolen huge amounts. So to me, it looks like it's possible that that could be, that could end up being forged into another type of controlled currency in some way, which sounds crazy to people who are into cryptocurrency, I guess, because it's the whole point is that it's decentralized. But if you can get a lot of people dependent on it and then uh, pull the rug out from under them because you have a large control of a large amount of the currency, you can do something to crash it, then people are going to be begging for more regulation on this cryptocurrency thing. And then all of a sudden this wild West that we see right now with the internet of money is going to become just another 
colonial province of the internet. <laughs> and so we gotta be, we gotta be aware of that. Let's not all put our eggs in one basket. I think the strength in cryptocurrency is the diversity of currencies and that we should be orienting what we put value in it, you know, to based on mm -hmm. communities around that currency. And then I think it'll work really well. Uh, yeah, dude, there's so many flagpoles there. I'm gonna, I could pick up on <laughs> right. So let's start, let's start from the backwards and work forwards, man. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so uh, just on a very, very base level, I, I, again, I, I think the whole of this, when I when I came across the blockchain and the whole idea of what that was on with it, I what I immediately didn't like about it, I wasn't one of the early adopters, but it was automatically even that point, the word currency had already jumped into the lexicon of language encrypt no exactly you don't why did, why did currency why did that even come into the into the into the whole lexicon of the language you, you know what i mean and that, this step leads me to step two is that people have run away with the idea of bitcoin being a currency bitcoin is never going to be a currency never it's going to go i mean do you know what i mean even if you, i'm not going to sit here and make any predictions but it's going to go to the point where it's hundreds of thousands and it's going to become like a, a reserve. It's going to become its own ego, and it's nothing to do with money. I th there's other, there's other, I could scan, I could spend a long time talking to you about my, um, exactly more, probably more cynical about Bitcoin than, than you are, brother, because I, <laughs> I, 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 I've got, I, I, I can see where you're coming from. And, um, and I think one of the, the biggest, the, 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 where we are right now is I think most people are getting, like you said, it's that wild, wild west thing and they've got the gold lust and they see, oh, it's going to, and they see 10 times rising. And I'm going to make a bunch of money. Yeah. It, it, exactly. That's never a good direction to go. If that's like your motivation, it's just going to, and it ugh. was never, it was never the motivation of the, of the blockchain. The blockchain was just going to be a public ledger. Now people have under, haven't really understood about just, just that one thing alone. If we've just used the blockchain for what it is, the public ledger, which for people don't, aware of it is the idea that right now everything is seen by public people can see where money's being sent to and this token called bitcoin is being sent from that one nobody knows who owns the wallet but we know where it's going to i can i'm gonna, I'm gonna put a flagpole there because i'm gonna tell you they do know where your wallet is but that's another we'll come, that's another conversation for a minute but the point being is this is the real to me the genie and the 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 power of the blockchain is because once you've got a public ledger and this starts to get out into people's consciousness they're gonna go wait a minute okay first thing i want i want all my governments to put all your stuff on public ledger so none more of this i get a bill at the end of the year and it's my taxes and i well I, i'm quite happy to pay my tax to go maybe into old people's care health care and looking after children i don't really want my tax money going into war funding you know operations to kill people on the other side of the world drone all that it, Public ledger does that because you can go, no, wait, you've got to justify where you put your money, people. And then we start to see the shrinking of the state. And with the shrinking of the state, there goes their, their power because the only power they've got over us is that they have these laws and they have at the end of that a gun. And that's the only power that, and the reason they do is because we all comply to that. And it's yes. a mind, it's a mind melt. And if we all just walk, it's it a is, religion. It is a religion, and that's the, the thing. And I think the other sort of, and I, if I go too far away from the from the uh, from the uh, Bitcoin one about the Bitcoin wallets and stuff like that, and I think, as you said there right now, you know, some of it's going missing. That's just going to be like Wild West. That's just people like pirate ships. Going to, some of it's going to be lost on the bottom of the sea. Yada yada yada. And I, I, like I said, I don't really actually think Bitcoin itself is going to be a a currency shared or any of that and i see that to generally because i thought look where we are right now and it hasn't made any mass adoption so i think it's another thing i think one of the things that people should be aware of with with um if they ever get involved in any cryptocurrency or anything any i don't know how I, said, I said the word myself anything to do with this encryption or you know tokens or whatever it may be is one thing i should remember is get it into a paper wallet as quick as possible so it's not online i think that's something that people i've seen many people i've seen recently just doing i was oh, dude i saw it recently someone was sitting there and they were doing a bitcoin thing and it was like in a sit there in a, in a public space doing i'm like do you realize how easy that people could just they got all you know they can jump into your wallet and into a, you know your online wallet so that's one thing i think everyone should be aware of And I think to the point you're, you're saying, it, it's not so much that what is going to go disappearing. And I, one of the things I've, I, I, I tell you, this was a right, real, real mind melt when someone I had a discussion with it about Bitcoin. It was like, okay, so you've got a paper wallet. So you said, think of like um, 
say the guy who did the original white paper, he's sitting there and he's probably for himself got thousands upon thousands of Bitcoin, yeah? And they know it's all in one wallet. So they don't know who, like I said, who's got that wallet. But think of it this way. Every country every that's, got a, that's a government, which is 99% of the, the world, that one of their biggest budgets goes into black ops or into spying and into, you know, protecting, as they say, their own piece of land that they're on. So a lot of that is into operations like the CIA and other equivalents. Every, every state will have them. But then, then just ask yourself how much of every country right now of their internal budget are they spending on whatever you want to call them, black ops, CIA, FBI, M MI5, whatever you want to call them, whatever, which part of the world you're listening to, the part of your secret service as much, how much money is being filtered into having just money going right. Sit there and wait for that one account to be opened. And wherever it is in the world, because it's going to come up immediately, get get someone on it. So the minute it comes off on that that you know that that computer, that 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 private wallet's opened, bang. So they've got all the cities covered, all the think how much money that they're going to and what they could do, and think about how they, that's all they're going to do because the way they look at it, they're mining massive, like you say, pots of money. It's exactly what the CIA did with Coca-Cola. They went around the world. It wasn't particularly to sell you this fizzy drink. That was a side benefit. They wanted to have ears in every corner of the world so they knew what was going on, so they could control things. And it's the same with what this Bitcoin stuff. They, they, know this, they, they know these wallets. They know they've got sat in them thousands, like that original one. And they're just waiting for the day that's opened. So poor old, the owner of it, whoever he may be, I don't care, Mr. X, the minute he knows he can never touch it because the minute he goes to open that wallet, Whatever he is, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever country he's in, they're going to have their, like, he's there, get in there, rush, rush, the, rush the cars in and take that guy out, man. So it's made them, all these people I hear get together, it's like, Bitcoin's going to set you free and Bitcoin's going to do them. I'm like, no, it's, look at that guy, man. It's enslaved him. And in essence, all those Bitcoins are, are wasted. They're like gold on the bottom of the sea, man. And it's not something that people are aware of, that you should basically be wise about stuff. Be like a squirrel. Diversify stuff, man. Put them in small <laughs> amounts and hide them all over the place. Don't be greedy, man. These are common sense, as I said before. Things that everyone would do. You wouldn't put all your cash you know, in a, in a, in a one in, in a piggy bank and just put it under your bed and leave your house keys at, and walk out without your house keys. Everybody knows that, but we've kind of like, we enter this new digital world and everyone's like, oh, I thought it was great, it's all Bitcoin and I'm going to make a millionaire and all their stupidity comes out and they wonder why they get ruined. And the trouble of it is, in the long run, then people become cynical of the actual good elements of what this stuff, this, this technology is going to do. Because people go, oh, it's just all a scam about money. And I, that's why I don't like the word currency money about it. Forget it. It's not about that. It's about in touching people and basically, like you said before, like, like you know, empowering people. And so there they go. This is a means of you getting out of that drudgery and going off and fulfilling your potential. And that is a tool like never before. It's like the printing press, dude. It's like the printing press. It's like that moment when we had the moment we are going, do you know what? We don't need the, you know, that, that middleman scribe and the, you know, we can actually read this book for ourselves and make our own translation. And that from, went from the Bible to people spreading information in pamphlets. And before you know it, there's revolution here and enlightenment's going on here and ideas has been spread and electricity comes and bang, this is great birth of knowledge. All comes from one guy who just put a machine together. And that's all tied in with this Bitcoin stuff. Like people getting, like, getting lost with the idea of making fortunes on the press and think, no, 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 it's going to be what's coming after it. It's going to be the, it's that, all it is, is a tool for people to free themselves. And they, and people, like any tool when they see it, like any early adopters, which is always a good thing, like the Wild Wild West, the, the obvious people is going to attract first to be, or the people who've got the gold lost. Great, flush them out. Because they do you know what I mean? I mean, do you know what I mean? That's always going to happen. You can't stop them. But at least we know, that's the great thing about them. All those people that are flushed out now, oh, I've got, I've got 2,000 Bitcoin in my wallet. Good luck trying to get that out. Especially if you're in America. <laughs> Good luck. I've, I've really heard several horror stories about people too having a lot of Bitcoin in a wallet that they can't access because they lost their pin number or something like that. And it's just completely gone forever. Yeah. So I, I like people literally are psychologically ruined over this type of thing because as the Bitcoin price goes up, they just sit there staring at the wallet knowing that there's more and more money in it and they can't get to it. But guess what? You can't eat that wallet. You can't uh -huh. eat those Bitcoins. And it's not anything like what a lot of native cultures would have used for currency, which would be, 
seeds or something like that. You know, you can, what it doesn't have any intrinsic value, our, our current currency system. So no matter how much Bitcoin you get, just like no matter how many dollar bills you get, if you separate yourself from the system that they're attached to, then you are just as helpless as the next person unless you actually have some semblance of self-reliance. So it's definitely not a liberating, it's not a liberator cryptocurrency. It's a tool that can get you on the path to self-sufficiency though. And that is an important aspect to keep in mind, but we're about to go on a whole nother tangent, but I have to sadly say that we're out of time. I didn't even bother to ask if you wanted to stick around for the plus extension in the second hour, but uh, we already c killed it. So clearly you wanted to, <laughs> I can't believe how much, how much fun this was, how fast it went. And I really would like to come on and chat yes. on your show, man, yeah. and uh, yeah. get you back on here again in the future. And before we go, could you just anything that you didn't get to bring up about your podcast or about your art or about network 99 that you'd like to go over? There's no time limit, but just no, any, I anything just, else. Uh, I was just going to say quite quickly, man, and I can't believe this is, it's, it's, I just want to say something kind of a, a man to man level. Dude. I, I've had like, I say many people guess the life is people. And I've yet to meet an artist and here I'm talking to one. And yet again, I haven't had any conversation about art. <laughs> it always happens. It's when you get two artists together, we never talk about art. And you go, oh, dude. So yes, dude, yes, you are. I'm going to have you on my show. Maybe we'll start with actually talking art. And I mean, on the practical level about two artists sitting down talking about art. So um, that's what I want to say on that, man. As I said before, again, I'm letting you, Please, anyone listen to this, wherever you may be, please come and join. Come, come and have a look at N99 because, as we said before, and, I, and this is why I say it, that it's for, it's for all of us. And this is, it, it, the, the strength of what we're going to do is, is going to be by us as coming together. And, and if nothing else, and I think you could witness and testify this to man. And, and I, I was saying this to someone the other day. Out of all the places at the moment, I know it's a kind of Swanish community, right? But it's, I take pleasure in it. I don't take pleasure in going to Twitter and that. And in the moment, it's nice because the subjects we discuss on the platform, and it, it's a nice working community, man. So that's what I'm trying to say. This, while we've got the opportunity before the doors go completely open, the people who are listening to this right now are ahead of the game and they've got the ability because they're ahead of the game to shape it. And, and great, let's make the strong community and we, we can start the, the core of this with love, compassion, true conversations and artists and us being on the same wavelength. Then we've got the core of this at heart. And it's before we open these doors because we know they're going to come and we know that, 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 that you know, the, the, the negative people and all the things that are going to come. So right now we've got this opportunity. So what do we do with it? Do we just sit back and go, oh, I'll leave it to everybody else? As I keep saying, dude, my generation did it and we, we were left with Google. And we went, oh, <laughs> don't worry, because he said they're not going to be evil. Don't trust. Um, this is the bottom line. Don't trust me. I'm a human being. Don't trust me. Make N99 yourselves. Make it you what you want it to be, not what I want it to be. Because I'm, you know, I'm just an artist with a vision. This is what it's about. That's, that's, you want my vision completed? Make it your own. It's not mine. It's, it's yours. Well, if people have a place to create in an authentic way, then what's going to be created is going to be in harmony with the vision you have because it's a vision of harmony. <laughs> you know, so I... I guess just thanks for this conversation, man. I, I, I could go on for a long time. <laughs> this is, this has been really fun and we barely scratched the surface of, like you said, we didn't talk about art hardly at all. Um, so yeah, maybe we can start there on, on our next chat. And I really look forward to putting this out there to people. I think it's, it's one of those conversations you have no idea what's going to come up and it ends up being afterwards. You're like, that was perfect. <laughs> that was exactly what needed to happen. And I didn't exactly know. You know what I mean? It's been yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying you get more proof and I think if ever it's needed, just like everything else in life, just, you know, life's about jumping into the murky waters and just jumping in and being real. And that's what I like. All the best conversations are just like we started this conversation and time becomes a loop. As we said at the very beginning, just be yourself and be in the moment because that's all it is. That's all life is. Being yourself in the moment. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much for giving your time, man. And, and um, like I say, I'll, I'll look forward to having you on uh, Life is People. And we, like I said, we're definitely going to pick it up with art first. But <laughs> Great. Like, we'll, we'll, get that, we'll get that done. And let's do it before Christmas, man. Let's do it. Let's make, let's make that pledge now and there. We'll do it before Christmas. All right. You got it, man. Perfect, man.
Yet another great show with a fellow artist who is trying to create a better world starting with the collective imagination. I have to agree with Tim that when it comes to how future generations will view the modern age, isn't it remarkable that they will potentially have access to this nearly infinite field of positive feedback being generated through the mediums of podcasts, videos, blogs, and the conscious people creating them, and just about any other form of digital creativity you can name. I like to think that, but there's also the very real possibility that this renaissance we're experiencing will all come to a halt as the totalitarian tiptoe of the maniacal monarchs throughout human history seems to be marching to an ever-quickening tempo. If history repeats itself, then the oligarchical masters must certainly be looking for a way to put the internet genie back into its bottle, and like has happened so many times before, destroy all records of dissenting viewpoints to the prevailing paradigm. And while listeners to this show most likely already see the value in migrating away from the highly corrupt and controlled corporate corners of the internet that we call mainstream social media, the fact is that what should be a mass exodus is more of a puny trickle. And based on the fact that there are numerous options for alternatives to the unholy union of Google, Facebook, and government, the multiplicity of choices leaves each of those up-and-coming new platforms vulnerable to hijacking by extreme right or left polarized keyboard warriors looking to find their new ideological echo chamber. And the lack of mass adoption means, by definition, that the average person isn't interested in trying out something new when they have a decade-long history with the big sites. But this isn't all bad. Decentralization is what we want, right? As for me, I'd like to work on changing my relationship to social media from one of strictly output to one of real human communication. And so I'm going to be scaling back the energy I put into sharing episodes of the podcast in 50 trillion groups across multiple websites. And when I get the urge to log into one of these sites, maybe find a way to say something meaningful or kind to just one person instead of casting my content all over the place with no regard to the actual humans residing in these digital domains. Anyway, I hope you guys resonated with this conversation with Tim Coomer. He's really a fantastic guy who has the best of intentions, a powerful imagination, and the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. And with those things put together, a person could really change the world for the better. In the Plus Extension, we took things quite a bit further down the rabbit hole, speaking about the origins of the modern status of so-called intel intelligence agencies as networks for dark occult sorcerers. We did more speculation about ancient human abilities and our natural potentials, thoughts on living in a world that rewards creativity over conformity, and the simple truth that when we're engaged with our inner creative process, we are inherently not destroying each other because we're too busy creating. Conscious anarchy, eliminating the need for meritocracy and oligarchy, and we talked about redefining the concept of honor to help create a free and trusting society. And that's just a few of the ideas we covered. Honestly, guys, if you've made it this far into the episode and you're not on Plus yet, you're not getting the full spirit of these podcasts. Of course, I make sure that the content of the free show is always quality enough to stand on its own, but seriously, if you like this last hour, I think you'll be absolutely into the next 45 minutes of expanded concepts that comprise the Plus extension because it takes that first hour just to get the basics out of the way and really be primed for some new ideas. I know in a world of Netflix and gym memberships, nobody wants to add another charge to their monthly payment schedule, but in reality, the $5 for a Plus membership is about like throwing me a dollar per episode, which, for the time I spend putting these together, it's a pretty fair thing to ask, in my opinion. Of course, all of this is more about inspiring you to either step up and start expressing your creative passions or rejuvenate your desire to continue your path, so any financial help I get from you is strictly a bonus Strictly up to you and not the purpose of this show existing. But that's my pitch, friends. Thanks for listening through it. And I really do hope to see some of you sign up for Plus on Patreon soon because there are several great episodes available. You can find a link to the Plus extensions in the show notes and links to uh, Tim's social media site, Network99, and a link to his excellent podcast, Life as People. If you like the music I've played in this episode, check out Wisdom Traders, also linked in the show notes. And one more thing. Since I brought up the fact that I'd really like more community to emerge around the show, and I'm a bit of a lone wolf online and I don't always make first contact, I kind of have an idea here. How about you go to iTunes through your computer or on the podcast app on your phone and leave a review for Interverse and I'll read it on the show, and you'll be helping the podcast find new listeners because Apple seems to use the review system to suggest content. I'm also interested in getting some listener feedback into the podcast in other ways too, so... 
If you have any other questions or comments you want addressed in an episode, shoot me an email through my site. You can also help the show out big time by sharing it with someone you know who will resonate with our topics. I'd rather you share with one person face-to-face than share to your thousands of online followers. It just means more. (laughs) But that's it for this episode. Big thanks to Tim for coming on. Big thanks to you for listening. I love you so much. And even bigger thank you to you out there with the infinite potential that you carry within. Remember, there are only two mistakes you can make on the path to truth. Not starting and not going all the way.